Those of you that are watching us by way of Rumble Live, welcome to the auditorium here at the West Marion Baptist Church. We're glad to have you this morning tuning in with us, and we've been looking at the last couple of weeks of running a race that God has set before us, and each one of us has a race to run. And the first two weeks, we looked at that race out of Hebrews and discussed many things and discovered some things that we need to do in the race and how we're to run the race. And then last week, we discovered that in running our race, we run into a lot of noise, Noise all around us, isn't there? No matter where we go, noise, 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 noise. Sometimes silence is golden, and it needs to be quiet. But a lot of times in our life, as we're running a race, it gets noisy. And you know what that can do. Well, we're going to continue that this morning as we take a look at it, but not on the noise. We're going to take a look at us thinking this morning as the Lord has put before us a race that each one of us has to run. Well, in our race and along our race, it's a long haul race. Remember, it's endurance with patience, run with patience and endurance, the race that is set before us. And uh, it's a lifelong race. Uh, It's not a marathon even, a 26 miler. It's a lifelong race. When you get into this race, it's till life. And it's for life. And along the way, we talked about obstacles. Well, I got to thinking about that. And some of the obstacles that I think we face in our race are trials. Everyone in here has a trial. Everyone's going to have a trial. And they're constantly, aren't they? And sometimes they're not so fun. Sometimes we don't like them. Sometimes we don't want them. Sometimes we've had enough of them. But they come in all sizes, shapes, size, colors, intensity, everything. And so along our race, so we can call them obstacles in the race. And how do we deal with the trial that comes? And we need to learn to distinguish between a trial, a test, and a temptation. Okay, a trial, a test is a testing, a trying, a proving of your faith and testing your faith that God allows in our lives or brings into our lives to grow us more spiritually, to grow in the Lord, to trust Him more, to lean upon Him more, and so forth. In those trials, there's lessons and God has a purpose. A temptation is something from the devil and the flesh, you see. God uses a trial to test us, to grow. The devil uses a temptation to destroy us. And so we have to determine, and then sometimes some of the trials that we have, uh, the Lord didn't allow it or the Lord didn't bring it on, we brought it on. Sometimes we produce our own trials by the decisions we make, you see, because we get tempted, there's the devil, with the flesh to want something. And then we start wanting it, desiring it, and coveting it, and next thing you know we're buying it, and next thing after that we know, uh uh-oh, I'm in financial trouble. Oh, God, help me, deliver me, get me out of this trial. Well, you got yourself in the mess, okay? (laughs) So we're going to take a look at that this morning. So take your Bibles and turn to the book of James, James chapter 1. You're very familiar with it, but we're going to look at the entire chapter if we can, as quickly as we can. But we're going to just take the first four verses and read them here and then move on to uh, talking about trials. Now, I've taught this many times, I've preached on it, but every time I go through to do it, it's something different. Always something new. It's amazing. That's what I love about God's Word. You can't exhaust it. It's fantastic. So if everybody's there, let's read. Begin reading with me. James. So now we know who's writing it, right? Introduces himself. Now notice how James introduces himself. He introduces himself as a servant of God. You notice he didn't introduce himself as an apostle. James, an apostle, like Paul, Peter, and some of the others do. You notice he didn't introduce himself as James, the, the brother of Jesus. I mean, think about it. If you're going to write this all, you know, I could say, hey, by the way, let me introduce myself. I'm James, and by the way, I'm the half-brother of Jesus. You know, that, that's a pretty good title, isn't it? Or I'm an apostle. Well, the reason why he tells us he's not an apostle, because he's not. This is not James the apostle. James the apostle died in Acts chapter 12, martyred, Okay. You can go read it in Acts chapter 12 if you want. But this is the half-brother of our Lord, James. And he's writing this. And uh, keep in mind when it comes to a trial, the higher the title, 
the higher the trial. The higher the title, the higher the trial. And James introduces himself with this title, I am a servant of God. Now you want to know how high that is? That's a real high title. Because Jesus didn't think it robbery to be equal with God, and he took on the form of a servant. How many think Jesus had some trials? How many think he had, even to the fact of the point in that trial that he became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. So, and yet Jesus took on that title himself as a servant. So you see, the higher the title, the higher the trial. So James takes this on, and he's writing to brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ, spread out throughout all of the realm under the severe persecution of the Roman Empire against the church and believers. And so he's writing this, and he says, I'm a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. So he's writing to the 12 Jewish tribes that are scattered abroad that are saved, brethren, in the Lord that have come to Christ. Greeting, my brethren, count it all joy. Do what? Count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations or testings or trials. Why? Knowing this, that the trying of your faith. See, the purpose of the trial, church, is to try our faith to strengthen our faith, for us to grow in our faith, all right? That your faith worketh patience, Ah, but let patience have her perfect work or complete work or mature work, that you may be perfect, mature, and entire, wanting nothing. So right off the bat, he, he tells us who he is, tells us who he's writing to his audience, and he tells us when we're going through these trials. So let's take a look at number one, the facing of trials. You might have a trial this morning. You might be in one this week. How are you going to face it? You've got to face the trial. And like I say, they come in all shapes and sizes and severity and, and colors and everything. And we face them weekly. So we're talking about facing of trials. And the first thing we learn in facing a trial, face them with what? Rejoicing. Wait a minute now. You've got to be kidding me. You want me to rejoice in the trial? Well, is that what the Bible tells us? We're going to learn this morning on how to face a trial. And if you're not in one right now, hang on. By tonight, you probably will be. I mean, it, believe me, something will come up in your life, and there'll be a trial. And, and you need to face it with rejoicing. Because realize, if it's a trial that God is allowing or that God himself is bringing on, it's for a lesson. It's to teach us something. It's to get us to learn us to grow in our faith, to strengthen our faith, to depend on him more, to trust him more in the trial. And so since you know that if it's not a, it's not a temptation that you brought on because of the lust of your flesh and so forth, the lust of the eyes, things like that, then, okay, well, this trial is from the Lord. All right, so what am I going to do? Well, I don't quite understand it all. I don't know how long it's going to be. I've learned in my life when trials come, the quicker and the better the attitude I have towards the trial, the quicker I get out of it. But if you start oh, and moaning and woe and grinding, oh my goodness, oh, and on and on and on and on, the trial's going to go on and on and on. Now, a lot of times, though, right off the bat, they come and we, oh, God, I don't want this trial. I don't, oh, oh, get me out of this, get me out of this delivery. No, wait a minute. Don't be so quick to get out of it because God's got a purpose for it. And he wants to teach you something and wants you to learn something and to grow your faith. And that's not going to happen if you get out of it. So let it run its course, but in the meantime, Rejoice. Face the trial with rejoicing. Look at verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers or diverse temptations. Hebrews 12, 2 and 3, look at it. Now, how, so put it underneath your notes here if you want. So, so how do I rejoice? That would be the question. Someone would say, well, how do I rejoice in the trial? All right, anybody ask that question to yourself just then? How do I rejoice? Or you're thinking about it? Well, Hebrews 12 tells us how to rejoice. Are you ready? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. There's how you're going to rejoice. You're going to look to Jesus. Don't look to the problem. Don't look to everything else. Look to Jesus, the author and the what? The finisher or the perfecter of your faith. Because remember, it's the trying of your faith. Who for the joy that was set before him, this is Christ, 
His race he's running, endured the cross, despising the shame, is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, for considered him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest we be weary by and faint in your minds. So how do I rejoice in my trial? I look to Jesus, the author, the finisher of my faith. And look at his example. He endured it going to the cross. And look at all the trials he went through just in a short time of his life. He was facing them constantly. And did you know that most of the majority of the trials that our Lord faced was from the religious people? They were from the Pharisees, the most religious and, and zealots of, of the Jews, and, and, and the Pharisees, the most religious there were. And then he had to face the Sanhedrin and, and, you know, and so forth, and the Pharisees and Sanhedrin and, and all that stuff. And, you know, and then he always had to face the Sadducees, the sad you see. See, they were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. And I want to tell you something. Every one of us in here this morning would have a, a, a frown on our face, and we would be sad if there had been no resurrection. Matter of fact, if there had been no resurrection of Jesus from the dead, let's just close the book and go home, because we've got nothing to rejoice about. I mean, that's the fundamental foundation of our faith, is the resurrection. And so look at our Lord. So we look to him, you see, when you're in the, in the trial. Look at Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Now, believer, start rejoicing in your trial. Now, if it's one you created and you know you created, then kick yourself in the britches and move on. Amen. And then say, God, I blew it. I messed up, didn't I? My fault. Now, would you help me? See, God's there to help you, folks. But you got to admit it that, hey, Lord, I'm sorry. I, just, I blew it. You, you, you tell God, this is on me. This is on me. And so I realize that now, and now I need your help. And he probably thinks, you know, you're probably thinking, yeah, I guess Lord Christ said, well, it took him long enough, didn't it, to admit it. And uh, now they want my help. Why didn't they ask me before it happened? Yeah. Isn't that what we usually do? But you know, any great the Lord doesn't do that. He says, if we come before his throne of grace boldly and we ask for help, he's going to give it to us in the time of need, even when we mess up. Isn't that great? That's great. All right? So now we're going to face the trial. How? If rejoicing. How? Another way we're going to face it. We're going to face it with reliance. What are we going to do? We're going to rely upon him. What? Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So you're going to have to rely on the Lord. So someone says, well, how do I do that? See, there's always the question when, when the pastor or the preacher or something says, do this or do that, and you're sitting there thinking, well, well, explain to me, how do I do that? You ever been that way? I'm always looking for the explanation from the preacher. You know, he's telling and preaching all this thing, and I'm, okay, I got you, I got it, I'm with you. All right, now, now how do I apply this? How do I do this? All right, so how do I have reliance upon the Lord? James 1.5. Verse 5 in our chapter here. Casting all, let's say, if any of you lack wisdom. Now, all of, I want you to make sure that this whole chapter, chapter 1, all 27 verses, if we stay in the content and the context, is all about trials and facing them. The subject doesn't change. The content and context doesn't change. So you get down to verse 5, and he says what? If you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men how? Liberally, that means freely, and abradeth not. That means no strings attached, and it shall be given him. So you see, when you're in the trial, rejoice. Lord, you have a plan and a purpose for this for my life, and I need some wisdom in this trial, how to handle it. I ask God every day for wisdom. Every day I get up, walk my dog in the morning, I say, God, today's a new day. I don't know what you got planned, I don't know what's going on, but whatever it is, I need wisdom for today. And I need your wisdom, not my wisdom. Amen? First Peter says, casting all your care upon him. How do I face the trial? Cast the trial on him. Why? For he careth for you. Jesus said, my burden and yoke is light. You know, cast your burdens on him. You remember when we, we had the illustrated message in here a long time ago, and we had a wheelbarrow? coming down the aisle and we filled the wheelbarrow up of all of our cares and everything and we brought them to the altar and we put them in the wheelbarrow first and you know we had people coming you know 
working it out with me, working the illustration out, and they're all down here, we're praying, and they're getting up, and most of them got up and started walking back, but one of them got up, took the wheelbarrow, and walked back. I said, now, did anybody catch that? Did you see what we were trying to illustrate? You see, these folks brought their burdens to Calvary, and those that walked back, they left them at Calvary. But you notice this person didn't leave them. He turned around and took them back with him in the wheelbarrow. Cast your care on him. That's, how, that's reliance. You've got to learn to rely on him. Philippians 4, 6 says, Ah, be careful for nothing. Or some may say be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. So in facing the trial this morning, church, you've got to face it with rejoicing. You need to face it with reliance. Let's continue on and take a look at it some more. Then you need to face it with resilience. Resilience. Look at verse 4 again and verse 6 and 8. We'll look at it. Face the trial with resilience, but let patience have her perfect work. The word perfect here means complete or mature, that ye may be complete, mature, and entire, wanting nothing. All right, but here you go, resilience. But let him ask in faith. When you pray, do you ask in faith? I mean, if we don't, then why are we praying? The Bible says that all that come unto him must believe that he is God, and we must believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, 6, okay? All right, so here we do. We, we, we're going to come and we're going to ask in faith. Now, when you do, don't waver. Nothing, nothing wavering. Why? What, what, what if, if, I'm, if, I'm, what, if I'm asking in faith, why am I wavering? In my faith. For he that wavereth, you're like the wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. If you're wavering in your faith, then why are you bother even asking? You're not going to receive anything. I mean, if I'm asking God for I expect to get it. I expect to receive it. Now I want to make sure that I'm asking in his will. Amen. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And boy, how do I see that in the church today? I'm not saying our church. When I say church, I'm speaking in general. You know, 58 years in the ministry, I've seen a lot. And, and, and just, you know, you see people waver so much in their faith. They're here today and gone tomorrow. They're here one week, two weeks, and gone. Oh, I, can't, I love it. Oh, I love it. I love the old-fashioned preaching and the teaching and the words, singing out of hymnals. And they're two weeks and they're gone. And you get a hold of them and say, what happened? You know, the pastor especially, he's always worried. Well, did I say something? Did I do something? Because I'm a strange guy, all right? Don't anybody say amen, Miss Eden. <laughs> Folks, I, I, I try to just be real with you. I am what I am. What you see and, and hear is what you get. Is that right, brother? Come on, help me out, birthday boy. And birthday girl. You're a January girl. He's a January boy. I'm a January boy. Who else in here was born in January? So, oh, 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 hallelujah. What, what time? When? One, two, three. January 23rd. January 23rd. One, two, three, he said. A smart guy. He's the one, two, three. I was supposed to figure out one, two, three. Okay. <laughs> no, January. <laughs> All right, we got all these January babies in here. Fantastic. We got to sing happy birthday to all four of us. Amen. All right, where was I? <laughs> Double-minded man. And I'll call him on the phone or go and see him and say, what happened? And I, the first thing I do, I say, did, did I say anything to offend you or, uh, or anything? No, no, everything's fine. I said, well, did our church? Then I go right to you guys. How about some of our members? You tell me who they are. I'll go after them. I said, did they say anything or didn't? No, no, no. Well, what, what, what's happened? I said, two weeks ago you told me you'd found your place, you loved it, the singing, the preaching, everything, the warmth and friendliness of our church, the whole nine years. Well, now we want something more exciting and we're something more contemporary and wilder. And you know what that is? That's a double-minded man. See, he's unstable in all of his ways. See, he's one thing one way, and the next week he's something else. And you know what? That'll last for so long, and then it'll be something else. You see, so that's what James is telling. We've got to have resilience, folks. You're not going to have resilience if you're jumping around every other week. If you're running from here to here to there to there to there, and you're not going to have any resilience in your trial. Okay, so, all right, so we got that. 
So look at, verse, uh, look at James 1.12. Drop down to verse 12. All right. Blessed is the man that what? Endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So you've got to have resilience in the trial. And folks, but believe me, you go through one and you think, wow, I'm done. The test is over. Way to go. Guess what? Get ready for number two. You're not going to get off this planet without a trial. You're not going to go probably a week or two without some type of a trial. Whether it be a phone call, something happens, you, you, I mean, you just, finances, you name it. Doctors, medical, health. I mean, you just, we're not going to get off the planet uh, without the trials. And so in the trial, we've got to learn to rejoice. We need to have reliance. We've got to rely on Him in the trial. Don't rely on yourself. Rely on Him. And then have resilience, man. Hang in there. Just tough it up. Tough it up, Marine. Amen? I tell our Marines in here all the time. Now, don't get excited. Suck it up, Marine. Huh? What do you got to do as a Marine? You got to improvise. You got to adapt. All right? So the trials come, adapt. Have resilience. Okay, secondly, number two, we're going to look at verses 9 and 11 now in our trial. The fraudulent, the fraudulence of trials. The fraudulence of trials. And here's where we need to be careful. First of all, number one, the comparison of trials. When you're going through a trial, church, and you're facing it, don't compare it with someone else's trial. Hello, don't look at sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so and try to compare your trial to their trial because their trial and their race is different than your trial and your race. And you may have a similarity of trial, but believe me, God's got something different in it for each one of you. And yours isn't going to, your race isn't like the, their race. Their race is not yours. Their trial is not yours, and your trial is not theirs. Don't compare yourself to somebody else's trial. Or compare your trials to someone else. Listen to what James says in verses 9 through 11. Look, notice he talks about two different type of people here. Let the brother of low degree, now some of you can say that's me, and that's okay, do what? Rejoice in that he is exalted. But the rich... See, here's the comparison between the brother of low degree and the rich. But the rich is that he is made low. Now, he's just using this as a metaphor here to give you a comparison between someone that's on the lower end or the poorer end of the stick and somebody that's on the higher end of the stick. Don't let the poor person try to compare themselves to the rich person. It's not going to work. Okay? He is made low. Why? Because, he says, here's the reason why. Because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. That is what? The rich. For the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of, of the fashion of it perisheth. So shall also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. James is just using that as an illustration between a poor person and a rich person. Don't compare yourself to, with your trial. You know, because the, 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 there's the fraudulent of trials. 2 Corinthians 10, 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number now watch the next word, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. See, don't compare yourself and your trial with someone else's. Everyone's got a different race in here this morning, and every one of us has a different trial. And yours may be little and light, and theirs may be big. But guess what? The next time it rolls around, yours may be big, and his may be light. You know, it's whatever God has for each of us. Run your race. They don't compare. Compare ourselves with that, uh, that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, guess what? You're not wise. See what the scripture says? If you're comparing, you're not wise. So don't, don't, don't compare. The fraudulent, of the fraudulent of trials is what happens. We get to comparing ourselves with someone else. You don't want to do that. Because if you do that, you're not wise. See, and, and if you're doing that, then you just forgot what you just read. You asked God for wisdom, and now you're comparing yourself with everybody. And God says you're not wise. There goes your wisdom right out the window, right? <laughs> okay. All right. 
So there, don't compare ourselves in the trial, but let's look at verse 13. Let's look at the cause of trials. Everybody in verse 13 of James here, we're taking the whole chapter. The cause of the trial that you're in. He says, let no man say when he is tempted, that I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. In other words, don't blame God. Don't, 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 don't blame God. Well, God, why did you tempt me and all this? No, God can't be tempted with evil, and he doesn't tempt you and I with evil. That's why you've got to learn to distinguish between the trial, the test, and a temptation. See, the devil's going to tempt you to do wrong. The devil's going to tempt you to, to yield to the flesh and to sin in it because he wants to destroy you, but God wants to test you to strengthen you. Amen. You just you got to learn the difference between the two. You've got to have a little bit of spiritual discernment. Now, and, and you, you, you still can look at yourself now. If you're sitting there on the computer or the television and, and you're gazing and watching at stuff you shouldn't be watching to and listen to, and then all of a sudden you start having a problem, don't blame God. That's your fault. Amen. Come on now. All right. So the cause of the trial is to don't blame God. God's not the cause of it. James, and look at verses 14 and 15 because he's going to continue answering this question. He says, but, let, but every man is tempted. Now here we go. Here's the temptation. When he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. See, that's when you're tempted. What does 1 John 2, 15 and 16 say? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For the love of the world is not of the Father, but of the world. And then he goes on. Here's the love of the world. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life is of the world. Those are the three things of the world. And we're not to love them. The flesh, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's the world. And when Jesus told the disciples, he says, in this world you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer. What did he say? I have overcome what? The world. What is the world? Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life. That's the world. And Jesus said, I overcame that. And you can too. Because in Revelation, he wrote seven letters to seven churches. And at the end of every one of them, he says, To him that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. To him that overcometh, I will give. And if you'll read what those letters say to each one of those churches, you'll see the problems that they were having. And all their problems had to do with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. So he says, he that overcometh, you overcome those things. That's the world. Then he says, you're going to get the blessings that he offers there in Revelation to those churches. All right. So the cause of the trial. So you're tempted. He's with his own lust and enticed. Then notice what happens in verse 15. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth what, church? Death. Sin's going to bring forth death. Death to your life physically. Death to your life spiritually. Death to your, uh, your, your plans. I mean, death to everything if you're not careful with it. Sin destroys. He's talking about the temptation. See, the devil wants to tempt you to destroy you because the wages of sin is death, right? The soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. You say, well, I didn't die physically. No, but your plans can die. Your home can die. Your family can die. Your marriage can die. Your finances can die. Death can come in a lot of different ways, folks. And so we got to get so be careful when we're, we're going to face the trials with rejoicing, with reliance, with resilience. Then we're going to have these fraudulent trials. We've got to be careful not to compare our trials. We learn the cause of the trial. Okay, we see it there. All right, let's move on very quickly. All right, the comfort of trials. Did you know that trials have a comfort to them? Look at verse 17 with me. Now remember, stay in the content and the context, all right? When we study the Scripture, folks, we've got to stay in the content and the context. All right, the text of the Scripture is, is in a content. That's a box. Isn't that what you do when you put something in the content? You put it in something, a container, the contents, the text. So we're staying in it. Verse 17, the comfort of trials. Here, boy, you're not going to like this one. Every good gift, oh, wait a minute, in the content and the context, are you telling me that a trial is a good gift? That's what James is saying, if we're going to stay in the text and stay in the content. 
All right? Every good gift and every perfect gift is from where? Above. So your trial, not your temptation, but your trial is from above. And it's a good gift. It's a perfect gift. And it cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So you see, you've got to look at your trial as a gift from the Lord. Now, you probably haven't done that. You probably don't think that too often. Hebrews 13, 5 says, Let your conversation, that's your lifestyle, your manner of living, be without covetousness, okay, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now, church, you need to keep in mind, in your trial, it's a trial, a perfect gift from above that has come down from the Father of lights. And we're to do these things we're looking at. And you need to learn that the, this, in this thing that Hebrews tells us that in this trial, no matter how hard or how bad man it may be, God has promised that he will never leave you nor forsake you in your trial. He will not abandon you. And trials sometimes are pretty tough, aren't they? They are. Sometimes deep financial tr trials are pretty tough to handle. Depression, discouragement, a death, death in the family, death of a loved one, a death of a child, a death of a mate. Those are some tough trials. They really are. And uh, you get a phone call on the, from the doctor, you need to come in, I need to talk with you. Just want to let you know from your exams and CAT scans and so forth, you have cancer. Nobody wants to hear that. But well, wait a minute, is that a trial? Oh yeah. Is it a perfect gift from the Father above? Amen. Nothing happens to us that God does not allow. And you want me to rejoice in that? Uh-huh. You want me to be thankful? I don't know how to handle this. Then ask for wisdom. It's a perfect gift. And by the way, no matter what you've got to go through in this cancer, whether it be chemo, radiation, so forth, surgery, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And I will never abandon you. I'll be with you in the trial. And a lot of times, see, God gives us those so we can be a blessing to others. As a pastor, how many times I've had people say, Pastor, you, you don't understand. You know, I have cancer. I have this and, you know, so forth. And sometimes I have to say, well, I do. And then I say, well, let me take that back. I, I kind of understand the, the heartache you're going through. But no, I really don't understand it because I've never walked in your shoes. But you see, when they come to you and say, I've lost my mother, I've lost my father, my grandparents, everybody, by the time I was a teenager, you, 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 you don't know. I said, oh, but I do. I've been there. I've been there. Well, you don't know. I've got cancer. Been there. Radiation, chemo, surgery. She's been there twice. But God never abandoned us. He never left us. Oh, it was a heavy trial. Oh, yeah. And, you know, these things happen. And, and you're able to comfort others. They come up to you and say, Pastor, the doctors just inform me I have stage one, stage two, this type of cancer, whatever. And, and you say, and you try to say, I, I, I'm with you. I, I understand what you're going. Pastor, you don't know what, you know, you don't understand. And some of them used to tell me that. And I would have to say, you're right, I don't. Because I've never been there. But a lot of things I can say, oh, but I do. I've been there. I know what you're going through and what you're experiencing. And so, you know, God brings these trials and you're going to tell me that cancer is a perfect gift. It cometh down from the Father of lights. If it's from God, church, because he's a perfect God and he's a good God and a gracious God and it's something he's allowed in our life for a lesson, for a purpose. And we had to trust him more than ever during those times and rely on him more than those times. And you will too. 
People say, Pastor, you, I'm here this morning, but I, I'm hurt and I don't want to be here. What happened now? My dog passed away today. How well, some people take that lightly? I don't. And I feel for you, man. I lost my Sadie due to cancer. I mean, you know, these things happen. They get sick, whatever, and, and I'm, I'm feel with you, man. I'm there with you. You say, oh, a dog or, well, for some of you cat lovers, it's okay. The Lord bless you. I'll pray, I'll, I'll pray for you. But uh, dogs, uh, yeah, been there, man. I know. You fall in love with them. They become a part of your life, your family. And it's just like losing a, a child but with four legs and hair. People tell me, I mean, children, I say, oh, yeah, man, I got one about eight years old now. It's growing really fast, doing good, man. Oh, really? I said, well, it, 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 unfortunately, it, it's hairy. It's hairy. I said, yeah. Like Esau or Jacob, whichever one had all the hair. I don't remember. Yeah, and I says, and it was born a little deformed. It's got four legs. Okay, I got it. I got it. All right, what kind of dog you got? I have a Belgium. Crazy lunatic. Amen. All right, a little quickly, we've got to move on here. The function of trials. The function of trials. All right, verses 19 through 25, he covers the function of trial. We must restrain the flesh. Verse 19, you have to restrain the flesh. Look at verses 19 and 20. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Why? For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. There's a function for the trial, and that is for you to be swift to hear and slow to speak and slow to wrath. That's the function of it. Here's a good one here, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Casting down your imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You're not going to restrain the trial if you're giving in to the flesh. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. You've got to restrain it. You've got to bring that thought that's coming to your head or your mind into the obedience of Christ. Okay, the function of trials we must receive. Let every man be swift to hear. See, slow to speak. Slow. You've got to be swift to hear if you're going to receive something. Look at verse 21. And receive with meekness. What am I to receive in this trial? I'm to restrain it because I'm to be swift to hear, but I'm to be slow to speak. I'm to be slow to, to wrath, and then I'm to receive. What am I to receive? Let every man be swift to hear, slow to, in verse 21, and receive with meekness the engrafted word. What are you to receive in the trial? The word of God. Good thing you're here today because you're receiving the word of God. See, that's what you're to receive. The ingra- well, now, what is, notice what that's, what that's able to let do. Keep all of this in the content and the context of a trial. All right, are you with me? So now, if you hear the word, then you're going to receive the, with meekness the engrafted word. Now, notice what it says the word's able to do. It's able to save your soul. In other words, for save there is deliverance. You want deliverance? Then you've got to receive the word. And I have found through all the years, people just simply don't want to hear the word. And then they wonder why. There's always problems and troubles, George. They don't want to hear the word. Why are we going? But, you know, you're not receiving the word. You're not going to receive the word if you're not swift to hear. See, you know, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Romans 10, 17. Are you with me? See, so you've got to receive the word. That's why you're here this morning. You're receiving the word. In a little bit, you're going to receive another word. Tonight, you're going to receive some more word. Wednesday, you're going to receive some more word. That's going to help you with the trial this week. That's going to bring deliverance in the trial in your life. It's important. Memorize this, this, this passage here. Psalm 119, 9 and 11. Withal shall a young man cleanse, man cleanse his way. How do we cleanse our way? By taking heed thereunto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Now, don't ever forget this one. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. 
The Word of God is what, church? It is a lamp unto your feet, and it is a light unto your path. It is a bomb in Gilead. You're hurting today? You're going through some tough times? Get in the Word, because it's a bomb of Gilead. It's a healing. I can't stress that anymore. So the function of trials, you got to restrain it. you got to receive it. And then, you know what, there's a... a let me quickly just give them to them so you can fill in your blank. All right, see, we must respond. In verse 25, 22 through 25, we must respond in the trial. I'll just read the first word. Be ye doers of the word. That's how you respond in the trial, to be a doer of the word. And there are some verses you can look at it later. Then down in number four, the fruit of trials, verses 26 and 27. The fruit of it, you know what a trial is going to do? A trial is going to reveal your character. Uh-oh. See, here's where the real character comes out in somebody when they're going through a trial. You ever notice that? Man, I, I've seen believers totally change like from night to day in a trial. I mean, and, and, and wow, sometimes stuff comes out of their mouths like you never would think or hear about. You know what happens? Their true character's coming out. See, a character's going to reveal your trial. You can read it later, okay, and I pray that you will. Then you, there, there needs to be rigorous care. Verse 27, rigorous care there. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. All right, and you can go on and read there. And then see there so you can put in your notes if you're feeling. Verse 27, you have to remove contamination. You've got to remove contamination in your life. James 1.27, what does he say? And to keep himself, what? Unspotted from the world. You've got to remove contamination. Now, all of this is in light of trials, and it's all in light of what? Running our race that is set before us. You're going to have a trial. Some of you may be in some already right now. Could be light, could be small, heavy, I don't know. That's why we have to be so sensitive to people that walk through the doors and come into this church. Some of them come in here with a smile on their face big enough you could drive a Mack truck through. Man, they're light on their feet. They're, they're excited. They're motivated. I mean, they're just, and others come in here, and you can tell. You can just look at their facial expressions that they're going through a tough time. Things aren't going well. And the last thing they want to hear from you, oh, what'd you do? You need to be sensitive. And by the way, their trial may be humongous to them. And they go to share it with you and you go, you've got to be kidding me. That's a Sunday school lesson in the kindergarten class. But to them, it's big. And you might share yours with you that you think is a Sunday school class, a picnic, a walk in the park. And they sit there and, oh, I can't believe it. How are you doing this? How are you handling this? How are you going through this? Because in their mind, this thing is huge. Because you see, everybody has a different trial in their race. So let's be careful in the trials. Let's run the race, but be aware of the trials that come in the race. How to deal with them. Father, thank you for today. We love you. We appreciate you. Thank you for this wonderful class this morning, this good group, Lord. We give you praise and honor and glory for it. Bless our time now in the service. Those that are coming in, as Miss Juanita says, they're coming in by the hundreds. Amen. See there, church? Positive. Yes, God bless you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.